chief phlebotomist is going to take some blood from me. First of all, she's going to put the tourniquet on and just watch how this is done. You connect it together and because it's elastic, you pull on it so that then the venous return is obstructed. When you're taking blood from a patient, which is usually going to be one of the wards, it is best to have the patient so that their arm is well supported, and whether this is in bed or on an armchair, always make sure there's something like a pillow or some other support to hold the arm steady during the actual process itself. <clears throat> now, I do have a tourniquet on my arm already, and I want to point out the most useful veins for collecting blood from. Now, there are three veins in the anticubital fossa which are ideal for collecting blood. The two best ones are the median cubital vein, which goes into the basilic. There's the vein which joins the median cubital to the cephalic vein, and many people do actually prefer this vein because it is well fixed. The cephalic vein is a less good vein to use. It looks quite attractive, but it is much more wobbly than the other ones. And in fact, taking blood from this vein is in fact more painful than it is by using the center veins in the anticubital fossa. In addition, you want to develop one finger which becomes exquisitely sensitive at feeling for veins. By and large, in most people, veins are easily visible, but they're not always so in all of us. Some people have very large veins which are deep down, and whilst you can't see them, they are very easy to palpate. And you want to develop, as I said already, one finger which becomes exquisitely sensitive to feeling for these veins. Veins that you can feel and see are, of course, the ideal. A lot of us, of course, have smaller veins down the course of the arm. These might look fine, but they're much more fragile, they're much thinner, and whilst they're more visible, they're really ones to avoid unless you have them a lack of veins in the anticubital fossa. These are big veins, they're thick-walled, and they're well fixed. The patient, meanwhile, clenches their fists to try and pump blood towards the venipuncture site. Now, the next thing to do is to feel for the veins and go for the one which the operator is going to feel most comfortable with. You then swab the um, area with a spirit swab. This sometimes helps the veins to stand up, but be most careful that you allow the spirit to dry completely first. That's for two reasons. Firstly, the cleansing action of spirit works as it dries. The second thing is the patient won't thank you if you do a V-puncture through an arm which has got wet spirit on it. It stings intensely. When you're ready to perform the V-puncture, make sure that your required sample bottles are close to hand and that the needle holder has been assembled. Pick up the needle holder quite naturally so that your thumb is on top and the fingers to the one side and you have a clear view of the needle holder. Remove the guard and without changing position approach the patient's arm and pierce the skin and the vein making sure that your fingers do not change position and you therefore have a clear view of everything that's going on. You can see the blood entering the tube, you can see that the needle is steady in the vein and if you follow this technique you will not come to any grief. Now we're now going to go ahead and do the venipuncture. The important thing is to line yourselves up completely correctly and apply slight pressure on the vein, but not so much that you obliterate it by pulling too hard. Then you approach the skin and slip the needle through the skin 
and up into the vein. You then watch it very carefully so the needle does not move and it's best to not change hands, although some people do so. Now you'll see that blood is flowing up into the tube and when it's full, oh, take the second one down, take two, okay. okay. You take it off but you keep the thing anchored to the skin the whole time. Push it on and up it goes. And when it is filled, it'll only take the correct amount. And when we've got all you want, you then take the tube out, release the tourniquet first, take the cotton wool ball, and once the needle is out and the patient is pressing on the cotton wool uh, swab, then the patient is asked to release the hand, just open it, and at the same time maintain pressure on the cotton wool swab whilst the sample bottles are being labelled up ready for dispatch to the laboratories. The philosophers now ask the patient to move their finger, has a look at the venipuncture site, make sure it is not oozing, and then applies a small plaster to it and tells the patient that the sample we sent off to the laboratory the result will get sent to the doctor or whatever in due course. Having completed the venipuncture, it's important to dis dispose of the needle and the vacutainer holder if it is contaminated. Now, we have at the top of this sharps box a slotted area which you slide the needle into and just turn it round until it comes off and then drops down into the container itself so that it is not being exposed to any fingers or the like in the process. Now if the needle holder is contaminated then you should also dispose of that as well. If you're collecting blood from high-risk patients then as a hospital rule that people should wear gloves to collect blood from such patients. Some people prefer to wear gloves collecting blood from any